If you haven't already, please watch part 1. We are now picking up from Matthew 22.10. Christ had made other prophetic parables of universalism like this elsewhere in the Gospels. In this verse, we see a theme which was also repeated in his parable of the net as recorded by Matthew earlier in his account. And it reads from Matthew 13, 47 to 48. Again, the kingdom of the heavens is like a net having been cast out into the sea and it gathers from out of every race, genos, which when it is full, bringing up upon the shore and sitting, they gather the good ones into vessels, but the rotten ones they cast out. In that parable, Christ had described the kingdom, meaning the dwelling place of his people on earth. The kingdom is among you. I've talked about this in one of my videos. He describes the kingdom being gathered out of good and bad genos at the time of his coming. The word genos is a Greek word meaning race. And the fish are divided by origin and not by behavior. This is because everything which God created was good, and as Solomon said, For you love all things that are, and abhor nothing which you have made, for never would you have made anything if you had hated it. But not all men descend from Adam, and not all plants in this world were planted by God, and as for Esau's descendants, who were intermixed with the Kenite Hittites, Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated. It would have to be this way. Prophecy demanded it. And, as Christ said, the wheat and tares will grow together until the time of the harvest. It had to be this way for us to understand the consequences of sin. They serve only as a tool of our punishment. An oppressed Israel, deceived and overrun by aliens, is a clear element of many prophecies, such as those found in Joel and as already presented from Jeremiah and Isaiah. And the immigration of aliens is a clear consequence for disobedience to God, as demonstrated in Deuteronomy. This is the tool through which the dragon seeks to destroy the woman Israel and her offspring. Now, despite the fact that Christ taught to bring the message of reconciliation only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and not to dogs, many had denied that instruction. As apostolic Christianity became distorted through the papal church, many began to evangelize those outside of the sheepfold, and they were casting their pearls to swine. If Yahweh God could not see the future, then he would not be God. That's his very challenge to the idols in Isaiah. Knowing that the universalist swindlers would bring in goats at the time of his coming, themes such as these, universalist themes, they are common in his parables which are related to the times of the end. Here we see that the servants furnish the wedding with many guests, both good and bad, and Isaiah 56 is an exploited chapter used to justify that very universalism which gathers in those very thorns and thistles. This chapter of Isaiah is exploited despite the plain fact that only Israel had the law, only Israel had the Sabbath, only Israel had become eunuchs, only Israel can return. And despite the clear context illustrated in the preceding and proceeding chapters. But people tried to use it to justify bringing in foreign peoples. Yahweh God knew that it would someday be corrupted at this end in order to achieve 
this universalist agenda that the wedding garment parable foreboded of. And Yahweh, seeing this coming, inserted an extra statement at the end of this future chapter division. And he says, All ye beasts of the field, come to devour. Yea, all ye beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving the slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. And how does this not describe the state of so-called churches today? These beasts are the same irrational beasts Jude and Peter talked of as infiltrating their assemblies and looking at their kinsmen with eyes filled with adultery. The same beasts who John said they came out from us, but they were not from of us. And as Paul said, not all those from Israel are of Israel. Then, going on, Paul went on to divide the denizens of Judea through the descendants of Jacob and Esau. These beasts are the same dogs who slew Christ through the power of the dog and had now corrupted Christianity. And ironically, afterwards, many began to call for evangelizing those same dogs who barked for his death many generations before. This deliberate misconstruction of the Bible eventually led us to a society sown with the seed of man and the seed of beast, just as was prophesied in Jeremiah. The same beasts referenced here in Isaiah, called in by the shepherds who did not understand. And this is how those without wedding garments are brought into the feast. This is how it happens. In the Gospels, Christ illustrated the kingdom of God as growing from the smallest of seeds. This is because when Israel was chosen by God, they were indeed the fewest of all peoples. We still are the fewest of all peoples today. But despite our endangerment, we still seem to be the sole recipient of the flood from the serpent's mouth. That is because the serpent has enmity against the woman and not against any other people. The flood is a weapon used to destroy the woman and her offspring. And what else does immigration forebode except extinction? This has been a weapon of the adversary from the very beginning, when he sowed the first tares, and Christ said that if the days were not shortened, that no flesh would survive. Now if you look at any statistical data of the world's demographics, you will see that Yahweh's words through Isaiah reign true where he said, For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. Going back to how Christ illustrated the kingdom of God is growing from the smallest of seeds, growing from that mustard seed Israel branched out into the most prosperous of nations, just as Abraham was promised. And when this happened, when this prosperity came, the beasts of the field then looked at them with eyes filled with envy. The prophets show us that what came next was their marching in to devour. In Hosea, we see that even trading with these peoples was a transgression. We were to be utterly separate, but we had failed. These were the spots on our Feast of Charity, which Jude spoke of, those cankerworms who came to pillage and destroy, as prophesied by Joel, and as Christ said, the kingdom is proclaimed and everyone forces their way in. We live today in a diverse society of every kind of fish, plant, goat, garment, 
and robe. This is why the mustard seed grows into a tree where the birds finally nest in its branches. Those same birds who nested in the ruins of the cities and lands described in Isaiah. One must see and recognize the importance of understanding biblical themes which were first explained and iterated in the Old Testament so that they can interpret the New Testament. These birds, owls and satyrs, now inhabit those old lands in Palestine, according to the Word of God, and today bastards do dwell in Ashdod, or else Zechariah and Isaiah's prophecies failed and the Word of God is untrue. But the Word of God is true, and we see all these elements and all these steps of prophecy completely manifest in our present day and age. In Revelation, we see that this tree which grew from the smallest of all seeds, when it grows and grows, it becomes a tree in which the birds went to nest in its branches, and that tree, as we see in Revelation, eventually becomes Babylon, the worldwide economic system which is described as a cage for every unclean bird. This is where we are today, and it happened because, as this parable in Matthew says, those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And through that, the seed of Israel was sown with the seed of beast, as prophesied in Jeremiah, because we have shepherds who cannot understand, and because this is the weapon of the enemy. Biblical prophecy is truly manifest when one understands the players and can see the uniforms, or as this parable describes, the garments. With a church redefining the plain meaning of Greek words such as seed and gentile, to try to somehow teach that men like Paul were teaching contrary to the Old Testament which they knew so well, speaking in some code despite the fact that he himself, meaning Paul, he said, Just as also you, unless by means of language you would give speech clear to understand, how will one know that being spoken? Indeed you will be speaking into the air. Paul never distanced himself from Greek and the plain meaning of words. Otherwise, he would have been a hypocrite. Sperma means seed, as in tangible, physical descendants from one's loins. Ethnos means nation, as a homogenous group of genetically related people and not a geographical boundary. A father and forefather are literal male ancestors, and Israel according to the flesh means Israel according to the flesh. However, these clear teachings of Israel according to the flesh uttered by Paul and received by him through the prophets were traded in for a dull spiritual Israel heresy, and therefore many goats were gathered into the sheepfold on the basis of their belief, as if their belief could turn them into a sheep, or if their belief could give them a wedding garment. This happened despite the fact that Christ taught that belief does not matter for those outside of the body, for even outsiders who profess belief in him will be denied, and their belief cannot change the prophets, it cannot change the law, and it cannot somehow include them in the wedding promised to the children of Israel. For as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2, And through which you are preserved, if you hold fast, to each statement I have announced to you, unless, outside, you have believed without purpose. Because faith is only for the children of Israel, and the wedding also only for them, as outlined in the prophets, being outside of that wedding party, one's belief is in vain. Likewise, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For men do not wear their wedding garments through belief, 
but your garments are your flesh. And Israel is recognized according to the flesh. For the covenants are of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you are not of the genetic seed of Abraham, you do not have your garments. Christ taught us that anyone who does not gather with him scatters. And today men call all the beasts of the forest into their congregations, as they can never have enough and they are shepherds that cannot understand. This prophecy of Isaiah succinctly describes how we got to the point where we are, where the wedding feast is now prepared to become filled with so many infiltrators. We surely had our part to play in the construction of Mystery Babylon, and that was done through our misplaced altruism, which the enemy took advantage of. But no one, despite their effort or misplaced goodwill, can ever gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles, so they should stop trying, and they certainly should, for those who lay the snares are judged more harshly than those who fall into them. As Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the faith is not for all. The wedding is for the recipients of the promises and of the covenants, and for them only. Otherwise, Christ commits adultery. The tares will instead be bundled, and we see this in the next verse of this parable. As we discussed earlier, the wearing of wedding garments means one must be in the guest list laid out in the Law and the Prophets. No one wears their garments through their actions or behavior because all the seed of Israel is saved. The Bride of God is not any single individual but is the nation, the people of Israel, collectively. Therefore. If one is not a part of the children of Israel, they are not a part of the bride, and they are not wearing the wedding garments, for they were never invited to the wedding. Any other interpretation is unscriptural. We read the marriage conditions succinctly. The guest in question here is identified by the appearance of his garments. He is spotted out, not through his behavior, but because he's not wearing the right garments. When confronted, he has no excuse or justification, but is instead speechless. There is nothing that can be done through action or behavior to insert yourself into the marriage relationship between Yahweh God and his people Israel. This guest in question here, he could have uttered out, but I'm spiritual Israel, it's not going to work. He's not wearing his garments. The word of God teaches us that no man is righteous of himself, but only because of the seed which lives in him. This seed is the seed of Adam, of Noah, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that seed which gives us access to eternal life. Christ taught us that only those who are born from above may see the kingdom, and being born from above means having descended from Adam. If one does not wear those garments, well, then as Christ said, they cannot see the kingdom which is prepared for Israel, and that is why this man in this parable is spotted out. The organization of the wedding is similar to the way the flock is divided in Ezekiel 34 and how the sheep and the goats are divided in Christ's parable of the kingdom in Matthew 25. In 1 Corinthians, Paul teaches us that even men with no works, meaning no good actions recorded in their life, none at all, the most wicked life imaginable, 
will still retain their salvation. And, as James teaches, if one breaks one law, then they are guilty of the whole law. We are not righteous through the law, but through Christ, and through him all of the seed of Israel is saved, if, of course, you are of the seed of Israel, if you are a kinsman to Christ, if the same seed which was in him is also in you. If one is guilty and thinks their brethren deserve the lake of fire for their actions, then we are all guilty, for we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Ultimately, no one can save themselves. As we have examined up to this point, the salvation through Christ was brought to the bride through the death of the husband on the cross. That divorce against Israel was blotted out on the cross. By examining the prophets, we can esteem that this guest is not wearing his wedding garments because he is not a part of the bride of God, which are the children of Israel on earth. Those who are outside of the bride namely alien peoples they're mentioned often in these parables and they're mentioned as coexisting alongside the children of israel in the days of jacob's trouble in the days of the end this we have already seen being present in that day of calamity they are cast out into outer darkness as this parable says here the outer darkness in question represents the second death, as the lake of fire is an ancient allegory for a cessation of existence, a complete voidance of existence. Void, the same void one experiences during sleep. If such outsiders, who are a part of this, alien peoples, if such outsiders are atheists, and we must remember that their belief doesn't matter, then they will get what they will be expecting. Therefore, Jude describes these peoples as wandering stars for whom the gloom of darkness is kept forever. Actions do not determine salvation, but instead your origin determines your destiny. This is why John the Baptist told the Idumean Pharisees confronting him at the Jordan River that the axe was already laid at the root of their family tree. The same men who John called a race of vipers, and Christ repeated that statement. The guest here at the wedding can be no one else except someone on the branches of that same family tree as that race of vipers, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He is recognized because he does not have the garment of Abraham, and is not a kinsman according to the flesh which would also mean according to the garment, because the garment is the flesh. This man can be part of no one else except for the same outsiders described in the end of Isaiah 56, as well as in Christ's other parables and the unclean birds described as being in Babylon in Revelation 18. It is this tree in question that will be cast out of the kingdom upon the second advent, and Malachi tells us that neither root nor branch will remain. For Malachi 4.1, reading the Septuagint translation, For behold, a day comes burning as an oven, and it shall consume them, and all the aliens, and all that do wickedly, they shall be stubble, and the day that is coming shall set them on fire, saith Yahweh Almighty, and there shall not be left of them root or branch. This is speaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, from which all these outsiders descend. Zechariah similarly describes a scenario of an Israel flooded by aliens, just as in Revelation we see the dragon seeking to drown the woman Israel with a flood out of its mouth. Waters represent peoples in prophecy. Psalm 118 shows Christ and his body of people on earth partaking in the threshing of the alien parties after the fall of Babylon, where it reads, They encompassed me about like bees, they are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of Yahweh I will destroy them. These themes, these parables, these symbols, these allegories, they are consistent 
through scripture. Trees have always represented peoples and bloodlines in scripture, all the way from Genesis chapter 3 to the Gospels to Revelation. Waters represent peoples, and thorns and thistles represent those Canaanites who were first described as thorns and thistles. That's what Christ meant when he said, do men gather grapes from thorns and figs from thistles? He was speaking of universalism. The marriage relationship between Yahweh God and Israel is the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New, for the New is a fulfillment of the Old. So in Zechariah, we read that upon the second advent, there will be no Canaanite in the house of Yahweh, because here in the Psalms, we see that they are quenched as the fire of thorns. And that means the same thing. And no Canaanite being in the house of Yahweh, we have to remember that the entire earth is his footstool. Therefore Israel will blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit, and they will build and none will tear down, for every plant which my father did not plant will be uprooted, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will be left without root and branch. Therefore, in the kingdom, only the tree of life is depicted as remaining. The tree of life representing the Adamic race, who are all wearing those garments. In this same kingdom, we see a description of the bride of Christ representing that collective children of Israel on earth, that wife being the anointed bride now reconciled to God through his death as the husband, as we saw prophesied in Hosea 2, with the marriage invitations sent out and the marriage itself now finally being held and consummated, we read in Revelation. We should be glad and rejoice and give honor to him because the wedding feast of the Lamb has come and his wife has prepared herself, and it is given to her that she is wrapped in clean bright linen, wedding garments, for the linen is the vindications of the saints. And he says to me, Write, blessed are those invited to the dinner of the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he says to me, These are true words from Yahweh. So we see again that to attend the marriage supper, one must be clothed in their proper wedding garments. This is of course allegorical and prophecy is often given in symbols, but what can we assert in these wedding garments to be? There is no doubt that one's wedding garments is their seed, their descendants being born from above, the presence of the Adamic spirit within them which gives them access to that immortality and access and fulfillment in those promises and those covenants. For as Christ said, unless one is born from above, they are unable to see the kingdom of God. If you were never a kinsman, how could you have a kinsman redeemer? The death of Christ would have meant nothing to you. It is through these things that men have eternal life. It is through their seed which lives in them, which gives them righteousness, which makes them an heir to these promises being born from above. Therefore, this immortality is the very vindication of the saints, as it says here. For although our adversaries may hate us and may kill us in the body, we will rise and see our Redeemer as he is, and therefore we will stand vindicated for our allegiance to God in this life. We will be risen and what we stood for will be shown to be true. As Job said in the first explicit biblical prophecy of a resurrection, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. And then, collectively through this, all the seed of Israel are vindicated in their salvation. For Yahweh says in Isaiah, he will swallow up death in victory, and Yahweh God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. Our people may be hated now, but Yahweh will take our rebuke from off all the earth. In Revelation, 
Israel is described, as we've said, as the bride waiting for her husband, and that will be the state of the world at the second advent of Christ. But that society, as we see in this parable and countless other witnesses, that society will be furnished with guests who are not outlined as being invited to the wedding and the law and the prophets. This is the failure of the shepherds who did not understand. The failure of those who went out onto the highways and brought in many, both good and bad. Therefore, these strange plants will not be wearing their wedding garments. So Christ will say, I never knew you, for he told Israel, you only have I known. These are divided by sight, just as the sheep and the goats are, and if they cannot be discerned by sight, then it is by their fruits which are made manifest, and Christ will divide them rightly, as he knows what is in a man. It is for this reason that the uprooting of the tares follows the second advent, for otherwise how could Israel ever blossom bud and fill the face of the world with fruit, and build vineyards which no stranger will any more pluck down? For this to be achieved, it is necessary that every plant which my father did not plant will be uprooted. To have your garments washed in the blood of the Lamb requires one to be a part of the covenants. Only Israel is washed in the blood of the Lamb, for Christ's death reconciled the wife and no one else was ever married to God. This is why when Paul encountered Ionian Greeks in Athens, he spoke to them a different message, for they did have access to immortal life as they did descend from Adam. But they did not have that same message of reconciliation, for they were never reconciled. Being washed in the blood of the Lamb represents the cleansing of Israel and the cleansing of those who were profane. The blood of the lamb therefore does nothing to cleanse goats, and goats have no place with the shepherd. Recognizing the tares and strange plants in the garden, they will be uprooted for what they are, for only those of their wedding garments will be able to enter into the congregation. The shepherd knows his sheep, and you only have I known. Therefore, those who are not wearing their wedding garments, Christ will cast out, as the kingdom is the inheritance of the sons of the kingdom, washed in the blood of the Lamb. This is the destiny Israel was chosen out for from the very beginning, and we read in the last verse of this parable. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many have been called into the sheepfold by those slumbering watchmen, those foolish shepherds who cannot have enough. But we can esteem through Yahweh's word that only Israel is chosen. If we gather with our shepherd, then we indeed gather. But to do anything else is to scatter and to bring in guests to the wedding feast who are never meant to be there. It is therefore our duty to discern the body and call the sheep towards their master. Thank you, and praise Yahweh, the God of Israel.